The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Seizing Opportunity in AML, How to Realize the Potential of Novel Therapeutics in Diverse Patient Populations. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash HCQ860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello. Uh, thank you all for being here. It's a pleasure to see you all, and I'm amazed you all woke up so early, so thank you. <laughs> Apparently, there's a lot of people online as well, so uh, welcome to everybody online. So today we are going to be talking about uh, seizing the opportunity in AML, novel therapies, and diverse patient populations. So our panelists today, uh, myself, Naval Davar, and we have uh, the pleasure of uh, a great group of colleagues here, Dr. Uma Barade, Dr. Courtney Leonardo, and Dr. Ethan Stein. Okay, so kind of moving along, uh, right along here. Uh, as we all know, you know, there's been a tremendous amount of progress in acute myeloid leukemia, which is great. We're all very excited, but I still think there's a huge, huge way to go. I think we're right at the beginning, at the tip of the iceberg, so to say. Uh, these are the drugs that so far have been U.S. FDA approved. Some of these are approved in other regions. Some of them are still in the stages of getting approved. And you see the list of targeted therapies, four of those, uh, two FLT3 inhibitors, mitostorin and giltritinib, and then two IDH inhibitors, ivocitinib, enocitinib, uh, BCL2 inhibitor, venetoclax, which uh, both in combination to HMA, and we'll discuss now in novel combinations, is showing fantastic activity response rate and is a major player in the AML space. Uh, CPX351, which in the secondary therapy-related AML is making great inroads, and we're hoping to improve on that with combinations that we'll discuss. And then maintenance for the first time now in ever, actually, in AML is uh, becoming available as a option based on randomized data. And then we have a novel targets, hedgehog inhibitors, glastagibin. It's actually not stopping there, but in fact, I think the research is more intensified. How do we combine these? How do we sequence them? TP53 and MLL, which have remained historically the big Achilles heels. Uh, now there are some hopes with new drugs that we'll talk about that are showing good activity in this group. And then I think there's a whole huge arena of immunotherapy that so far has not made it in AML, but I think the efforts uh, are now multiplied and we will hopefully see breakthroughs with immunotherapy in the near future. This was a uh, interesting kind of backdrop because you know a lot of what we're gonna talk about uh, unfortunately, still applicable in very large academic centers where trials are available. And this was a study that was, uh, it will be presented here at the ASH meeting by Dr. John Bird, where they did a real-world analysis of uh, clinics in the rural and metropolitan areas in the Midwest United States. And this is not that old. This is from 2011, 2018. And what we see is still in the last decade, so to say, uh, more than two-thirds or two-thirds of patients are not receiving therapy for AML above 75 years of age. And as we know now with the approval of venetoclax, that is the age where it is approved. So uh, hopefully now moving beyond 2017-18, in the next decade we'll see a major shift uh, in those numbers with more and more people being treated. Uh, and then even more importantly, genomic medicine and AML, you know, we tend to feel has been around and is a standard, uh, and it may be in the big academic centers, but only 13% had a genomic report in this uh, Series And hopefully, again, in 2017 onwards, with the approval of the FLT3 IDH inhibitors, this will uh, improve. But, uh, you know, suffice it to say, there's a huge amount of work to be done uh, to spread both the knowledge and the education, and, and hopefully events like these will help in that aspect. And then from uh, COVID, unfortunately, added setback to a lot of these things. Uh, and we do see that post-COVID, there's a reduction in the percentages of tra stem cell transplant, longer wait times, and I would bet that even access to some of the medications has been more difficult because the patients are not able to travel. We see this, uh, for example, in the Anderson, where it was difficult for people to travel for one and a half years. It's starting to pick up again. Uh, but I think, you know, there's a lot of work to be done in the near future. So these are the kind of three big buckets we're going to divide things into. Obviously, there's overlap between them, but we'll first talk about frontline high-risk AML. Then we'll talk about uh, frontline uh, BCL2 and targeted therapy options. And then we'll talk about relapse refractory, including immunotherapy, novel targeted therapies that are emerging. And we're going to try to do it kind of uh, basing it on uh, cases that we will present. Um, so with that, uh, we're going to kind of move into the first uh, section here. And uh, that'll be with Dr. Borate and uh, myself. And we're going to be talking about upfront high-risk AML 
seizing opportunities for the customized uh, care. So Dr. Baradi, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, and um, I'm really excited for this opportunity to be here with my colleagues. I'm at ASH 2021. I'm talking about the management of these diverse AML populations. So without further ado, let's jump into our first case. This is a case of a 69-year-old patient called Jonathan, who has well-controlled hypertension, hyperlipidemia, presents with pancytopenia. He's generally fit with a performance status of zero to one, has some fatigue, and his um, testing showed about 23% blast on his bone marrow biopsy, his cytogenetics showed a complex karyotype, but did, he did not have a deletion 17P or a P53 mutation. So what are the options for a patient like Jonathan, and what does our data suggest um, he can receive treatment with? So let's start with CPX351. This is a well-established option in high-risk AML. Quick reminder, this is a 5 to 1 molar ratio of cytarabine and donorubicin. And I think for patients that have secondary AML that have had prior therapies for other cancers, we always have to be mindful of the lifetime anthracycline dose, um, given that this is a combination with an anthracycline. So quick um, overview of the timeline of the development of this drug. In 2016, we had the results of the phase three study in newly diagnosed older patients with high-risk AML. As a reminder, patients were 60 and older. In 2017, this drug received approval for adults with newly diagnosed therapy-related AML or AML-MRC, which is myelodysplasia-related changes. And in 2021, it was now approved in newly diagnosed AML-MRC in pediatric patients one year or older. So this is um, a little bit of the data. We now have the five-year results of the phase three study that we just discussed. And if you look at the two graphs, especially the one on the left, you can see the survival of patients um, that receive CPX351 versus seven plus three. The three-year estimated survival is 21% versus nine, and the five-year estimated survival is 18% versus eight, as opposed to the graph on the right-hand side where the survival is landmark from the time of hematopoietic stem cell transplant. And you can see that is what makes the huge difference. That is the game changer where survival for patients that receive treatment with CPX351 is still not reached, as opposed to a 10.25 um, survi overall survival for patients that just received 7 plus 3 um, and um, then went on to receive a stem cell transplant. So clearly, there is a huge benefit if you receive treatment with CPX351, achieve a response, and then move on to transplant. And when you look at sort of the breakdown in the different populations, so these are the older patients, but then there's the younger older patients, so patients between 60 and 69 um, who achieved good outcomes with CPX351 still had a benefit as opposed to 7 plus 3. And then you had the older fit patients, which is patients 70 to 75 on the right-hand side, that when um, treated with CPX351 versus 7 plus 3 also um, had a survival benefit. So it seems like this is um, effective for patients 60 and older as long as you think they're a fit induction candidate. So let's talk about some practical points when you're treating your patients with this drug. So again, um, as we mentioned before, this is approved for adults as well as pediatric patients that have therapy-related AML or AML-MRC. I think it's a good reminder that this data does not apply to patients with AML that has transformed from prior NPNs. When you compare it with 7 and 3 in the phase 3 trial, in terms of side effect profile, which is really important for our patients, there were fewer GI side effects, fewer mucositis. There really was minimal hair loss, which is important for a lot of our patients. Obviously, we talked about the lower 60 and 30-day mortality, the improved CR, CRI, and overall survival. But I think it's important to note, especially when you're inducing these patients in the hospital, that they do have prolonged neutropenia and thrombocytopenia compared to 7 plus 3. So the median time to count recovery is about a week more, 30 to 36 days after cycle 1. This is considered an intensive therapy, so be mindful of that, um, even though it is very well tolerated. And depending on your practice, most patients um, will end up being admitted to the hospital and during induction. And then consolidation with CPX351 is the same dose, except it's only days um, one and three instead of days one, three, and five. 
So obviously with the advent of ESAVIN, um, and as Dr. Daver talked about, I think we're all moving to the next level of how can we even more optimize these therapies by combinations with venetoclax. And there is an ongoing study um, known as VFAST, studying how CPXC51 can be safely combined with agents like venetoclax, mitostorin, and enacidinib. Um, if you look at the figure on the slide, in arm A, if a patient does not have an actionable mutation like FLT3 ITD or um, an IDH mutation, they get assigned to the CPX with venetoclax arm, as opposed to arm B or arm C, where um, they get treated with mitostorin if you have a FLT3 mutation, or an acidinib if the patient has an IDH2 mutation. This study is meant to have uh, arms added in the future as combinations therapies become more available to various molecular groups. So the, the other big question that comes up when we talk about a patient like Jonathan is where does um, hypomethylating agent therapy plus venetoclax fit into the treatment management of such a patient? Uh, we all know that this is a therapy that, was, uh, that has been approved in this patient population based on the VLEA data, which was led by my colleague, um, Dr. DiNardo. Um, and as um, all of you know who are very familiar with this data, AZA plus venetoclax led to a statistically significant and clinically significant improvement um, in overall survival with a median OS of 14.7 months compared to 9.6 with AZA alone. I think for all of us who treat patients with this combination, we're also aware of some of the serious um, AEs that we have to look for, especially the cytopenias and febrile neutropenia, uh, which could lead to infections, um, pneumonias, et cetera, that we need to watch for um, in these patients. Notably, unlike CLL, tumor lysis was fairly rare um, in our AML patients. So let's look at the experience of secondary AML in um, this combination. So in the phase 1b study, which looked at a variety of combinations of venetoclax with azacitidine, about 25% of the patients enrolled on the study had secondary AML. And if you look at all the cohorts treated with a variety of doses, um, the CRCRI rate was about 67%, and in the 400 milligram venetoclax cohort, it was 73%. So these are patients with poor risk cytogenetics. They were 75 or older, um, still had CRCRI rates of 60 and 65% respectively. So I think that um, tells you a little bit about how a patient like Jonathan may do if he were older um, with the same situation um, if he had high-risk AML. So what are the practical points when you're treating a patient with this combination of NHMA? Um, so again, just to remind everybody, VLEA did include patients with therapy-related AML, AML with antecedent MDS, and AML MRC. They did not include patients that had prior hypomethylating therapy for MDS or MPN transformed to AML. This is definitely a, a very successful and highly utilized now um, optimal option for newly diagnosed AML patients, not suitable for intensive therapy. It's generally well tolerated. The mortality rate at 30 days is about 6 to 7 percent. But as I mentioned before, when you're used to treating patients with AZA alone, you do have to look for prolonged neutropenia. And the key is to do an early bone marrow biopsy and an assessment um, because if your patient has achieved remission or has no longer has any blast, we really have to act quickly to interrupt the VEN or dose reduce the VEN for the next cycle. Um, you can obviously use growth factors if the low ANC is prolonged. And there is a, a talk um, on, on Sunday at 6 p.m. looking at whether lower doses of AZA or VEN might be more effective once your patient has achieved remission more as for maintenance strategy. Another reminder, responses are quick within one month, so doing that bone marrow biopsy is very important to see where your patient is at. So let's look at a comparison between CPX351 and venetoclax as frontline therapy in AML. Um, so this is another study that will be discussed at ASH. It's abstract 32. This is a large retrospective study involving several large academic medical centers across the United States where they compared patients who received CPX351 versus Azaven in the frontline setting. And as you can see on the figure, Overall, overall survival was, was better with CPX351, and the groups that it favored were patients with TP53 mutations, prior myeloid malignancy, prior HMA use, and the ELN adverse risk AML, but there were a few caveats to this conclusion. And the, the, so, so let's go over sort of what those differences were. 
So if you look at the groups that went on to receive a stem cell transplant, the stem cell transplant rate was 48% in the CPX group versus 19% in the hypomethylating agent versus Ven group. So going forward to a stem cell transplant was highly significant for these improved outcomes. If the patient did not go to a stem cell transplant, outcomes were essentially the same between CPX or HMA Ven. And in patients that did go to transplant, irrespective of the regimen that they received, there was no difference in relapse-free survival or overall survival uh, post-transplant. MRD rates were also significant. So I think the message, um, as we discussed in the initial CPX351 study, is getting these patients into a remission and then moving them to transplant appears to give this patient the highest benefit. So coming back to our patient, um, who is otherwise fit, has some very mild medical problems, um, we, all, we all discussed different options, CPX351, stem cell transplant, AZAVEN as frontline, and I, I think we'd all really like to know what the audience is thinking and saying as well. Yeah, sure, and at, at this point, I'll kind of turn it over to uh, Dr. Stein uh, and then Dr. DiNardo to see what their thoughts are. I mean, this is a real-world scenario, and you know, in our leukemia meetings, Weekly, we have this discussion pretty much on multiple patients uh, many times. And so let me ask uh, Dr. DiNardo what her thoughts would be for this 69-year-old patient. Would she go for CPX, CPX combo, HMA Ven, and kind of what are the pros and cons here? So, I mean, these, you're right. These are the questions that don't have a right answer. And I, and I think one of the most important things to be aware of now is we have a lot of really good options that we didn't have a couple of years ago, right? So, so that's number one. Um, this patient definitely is a transplant candidate in my mind. So no matter what I'm giving him, I want to get him into a deep remission. I would love for him to be MRD negative and then transition him to transplant. Um, I think I will probably differ from some of the others on the, on the stage. I would most likely opt for an HMA Ven regimen. Um, we, we don't have um, as much long-term data and we don't have as much data in kind of a fit population, right? So that is, is taking a, a bit of a leap of faith. Um, but, but with the kind of similar response rates and the similar MRD negativity rates with the knowledge that we're moving right into a transplant, I, I, you can't, you're not wrong either way though. Great, and uh, Dr. Stein, what are your thoughts? Uh, what would you consider at Sloan Kettering for this uh, no, I, no, I'm not sure why Dr. DiNardo looked at me when she said that uh, my <laughs> colleagues did. might differ. Um, so I'm not sure I would differ. I mean, I also, I also agree that HMA Ven is a really great um, opportunity here and great for the patient. I'll tell you what I do in New York City because in the, my neck of the woods, my patients want to make the decisions. They don't want the doctor to tell them what to do. So what I do is I actually lay out everything in a much more simplified form that Dr. Borate just laid out for you. And I say, these are the two options. We think that they are probably equivalent, although the data is stronger with CPX351 because we have, those patients actually went on to transplant. And I'll tell you that nine times out of 10, the patients will choose HMA Ven because they don't like the idea of being hospitalized. And they don't like the idea of the side effects from cytotoxic chemotherapy even if those side effects may not be as severe as getting seven plus three. So I have moved in this complex karyotype, even without P53, not to recommending HMA Ven, but to offering it as an option. And I would say that most times patients choose that as their initial treatment option. So that's interesting. So Dr. Stein will show the peer review slides and ask his patient. <laughs> what they, but in, in Houston, you know, our patients say, doctor, what do you want? So, you know, it's a very different population. You know, I, I think there's, it's a tricky because both of these don't kind of stand in time, right? We know, at least in our centers, we're not really doing CPX alone. At least at Anderson, we're doing CPX plus, and we're not doing HMA Ven alone. For a lot of these groups, we're doing HMA Ven plus. There is some very nice early data coming out with the CPX Ven combo, as, as Dr. Barade said, uh, both from the VFAS study, and there's a, a MD Anderson IST with Dr. Kadia as well. And that option looks quite uh, interesting for these, uh, especially. MDS treated with HMA to AML where pretty much nothing works. Uh, so I would consider that in that sort of patient. In this one, I think it's a, a tricky question. I think I would think of uh, potentially either one and like Dr. Stein said, you know, maybe offer the patient. Now we actually do admit our patients for HMA Ven as well. So I don't know if that, at least at Anderson, would make it, uh, you know, the, the, the key point. It's, uh, 
Let's see, Dr. Borati, what do you think? So I think I agree with everybody, but I will say there is one scenario where I might prefer CPX351. Well, a couple of scenarios, I would say. One is something that Dr. Stein referred to, where, yes, an outpatient therapy is preferred, but sometimes, again, we, I practice in the central Midwest, and patients either do not have the ability to travel for this therapy outpatient or you know, just prefer to be admitted um, um, and, and are, again, you know, sometimes a patient makes the choice, well, I do want the more intensive therapy or the therapy that has more data or has been used for longer. So I would say social situations sometimes perhaps can dictate the choice as well in a patient where either one is not the wrong answer. But I think um, in terms of the patient presentation, I would prefer CPX351 in a patient who presents in a very proliferative manner. So with a high white count, you know, 50,000, 60,000, um, as many of you know, the label for Azaven, you really need to get that count below 25,000 ideally, and maybe even lower for that um, for cycle to be sort of uneventful and effective. So if the patient is very proliferative, there's a higher risk of tumor lysis, those are the type of patients um, and obviously fit for induction that I would actually admit and give CPX351. Great. And then maybe we talk about the transplant uh, approach here. I think the data that you showed was actually quite interesting that once you get them to transplant, whether it's with CPX or with HMA, VEN, the RFS, OS, look similar, which kind of was hinted on, you know, in a subset of the phase 1B with HMA, VEN that had been presented a couple of years ago at ASH, that people who got HMA, VEN went to transplant, I think it was 32 or 33 patients, they did actually looks like what would have been the same as somebody who got intensive chemo and transplant. So I think, you know, that, and then we have some data at Anderson that's been published to transplant outcomes. It looks like the transplant, once you get to it, outcomes are not that different, whether you're using the HMA VEN or intensive chemo. So timing-wise, um, I'll turn this to Dr. Stein. Where is the time you try to get these people to transplant, and what realistically usually ends up happening? Um, so in a patient like this, you know, the goal is to get them to transplant as soon as they get into a complete remission. Um, ideally, you want them in an MRD negative complete remission, but whether you keep hitting them with further and further rounds of either CPX or HMA VEN, whether that's going to get them into an MRD negative remission is an open question. So in my practice, the minute I get them into a complete remission, whether MRD negative or MRD positive, I try to send them to an allogeneic stem cell transplant. That typically happens very, very quickly. So with CPX351, we usually are preparing for the transplant during the time of induction so that they can get their transplant right after, you know, four weeks after they go into remission. With HMA VEN, it sometimes takes a couple of cycles of HMA VEN, and then they go on to transplant after that. Great. And, and maybe to ask a little more on that, so when, we, when you say complete remission, do your transplant team really want a full true CR count recovery, or are they okay with marrow remission? Because we've had this debate at Anderson with our transplanters. Yeah. Would... You, know, I, you know, the transplanters want a lot of things. The problem is that I can't, <laughs> I can't provide all those things for the transplanters. So, so yeah, so of course they want them in a true complete remission. But in a patient with high-risk disease, where you may not ever get them into a true complete remission, and where their relapse risk is quite high if you wait for three or four months and give them more chemotherapy they're going to become resistant to, I try to talk them into just taking the patient to transplant, and maybe they can do some sort of post-transplant manipulation, cellular therapy um, stuff that they do to try to prevent the relapse. So no, our, our transplanters will take those patients uh, even if they've just got blast clearance. Yeah, that's, and, and I think in general that's kind of what we have been able to do as well, although of course it's patient specific sometimes. Um, yeah. Could I, I was just going to say one additional thing in terms of the count recovery, which is important, and true CR is of course an important endpoint, but I think the MRD status of your patient before you go into transplant is probably even more important, and um, having a reliable way to, like by flow or molecular, depending on what you have, if, you know, if, if um, I think even if the platelets are only 80, but they're MRD negative, that is a patient that is highly appropriate going to transplant. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, you know, we all know, especially in these people who may have an antecedent hematological disorder, MDS, count recovery may be stunted due to many other factors, background, chip, et cetera. And, and I agree with Dr. Darno. I mean, if you become MRD negative, does it really matter to me if the platelets are 70 or 103? Not really, right? And I, and I think the transplanters are moving in that direction. So to that point, Dr. Donardo, you led the A's event, and you all, we also did at MD Anderson to decide to be in 10-day venetoclax. Is there a 
difference in those, do you think, or would you prefer one or the other, or is there a particular subset where you may prefer one or the other? Um, you see slightly faster responses um, with 10 days of decidabine with Venn, which is um, statistically significant, whether it's clinically relevant when the median response time is just about a month with either is, you know, is debatable. Um, we were really hoping the 10 days of decidabine with Venn was going to be an excellent treatment option for patients with p53 mutations right based on kind of nice preclinical and early clinical data that 10 days of decidabine was the most optimal treatment for p53 um, and unfortunately that didn't didn't pan out um, and so I think it is you know in patients who are more proliferative and you're really trying to kind of control that disease quickly I think 10 days of decidabine with venetoclax is a very appropriate strategy in terms of are there specific molecular subsets that benefit more from 10 days of decidabine I'm not so sure great thank you so I think we'll move on um, in the interest of time here Dr. Baradi you want to go through the yes so you know, again, to summarize this discussion, given, and this is something that, you know, all the experts on this panel have pretty much said, given Jonathan's presentation, his age and fitness, we all agree that he needs to proceed to a stem cell transplant as soon as possible. CPX351 is a sound choice based on the studies and the data. Um, and as um, discussed right now, HMA then is an efficacious and suitable choice as well. However, you don't, we don't really have a randomized frontline newly diagnosed sort of trial in patients who are induction and transplant eligible, although those trials are in design and actually will be coming very soon. So watch the space and we may be having a very different discussion in the next couple of years. All Thank right. You. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Brady. So in real world, I mean, we kind of made this case, but usually when you have complex karyotype, 70% uh, of those people will have a TP53 mutation. So that's the more common scenario. Yes, it does happen, 25, 30%, you could have a complex karyotype, not necessarily have a TP53. So what if the patient did have the TP53 uh, difficult to treat uh, mutation? What would we do in that case? Are there any other options in the horizon, uh, potentially? So this is kind of what we briefly discussed, that even with HMA venetoclax, where we hoped it would overcome TP53 mutated AML. That unfortunately remains a major Achilles heel. And these are two different studies. On top is the subset analysis of the phase 1B study, where you see in TP53 remission rates were not bad, 57% CRCRI, including about 30% true CR. So we were optimistic, but unfortunately, with follow up, the survival in TP53 mutated remained low at only about six months, whereas about 19 months in the non TP53. And then we at Emily Anderson said, well, maybe decide to be in 10 days. There's data showing that it seems to work quite well. It's published in New England Journal by the uh, WashU group. And could we then use decide to be in 10 days with venetoclax further improve that? And uh, we looked at it. But unfortunately, as you see, in spite of, again, good remission rates uh, in the TP53, including 35% CR, the median survival is only five months. So I think HMA Ven is reasonable if that's the option available. You could try to get them to transplant quickly but this is a very difficult group. So then we said maybe CPX351 has something specific in TP53. And unfortunately, very similar to HMAVEN, CPX351 definitely is better than 7 plus 3 in the non-TP53, but in the TP53, the uh, survival is again between five to six months. So we're kind of stuck in this five to six month zone in uh, general. So what are the new things coming along? And some of these will be presented at ASH this year. So one of the interesting immune pathways that has emerged after many years of kind of looking at different immune approaches that didn't work as well is uh, an approach that activates macrophages. This is called CD47 blockade. And CD47 is an immune checkpoint, but unlike the immune checkpoints that all of us have heard for many years that are on T cells like PD1, PDL1, this one is actually on the surface of a macrophage. And by blocking CD47 SERP alpha interaction, just like by blocking PD1, PDL1 interaction, you remove the inhibitory signal to macrophage macrophages are unleashed, and then they can attack the tumor uh, cells. And so this was very nicely published almost a decade ago now by Irv Wiseman, Ravi Majeri, and others, Stanford group, who elucidated the mechanism of this uh, drug and found that leukemias and lymphomas could be where these will work quite well. And so this is the data that's been presented so far of the azacitidine with megrolimab, the, the study is a phase 1b that's now completed and has two arms, one in uh, MDS and then one in AML. And in general, in all AML, the response rates were encouraging, overall response rate in the 60% or so range, uh, which is pretty good. And then the TP53 really where the focus is uh, based on the biology. And 
since this should be a mutation agnostic approach, we see encouraging response rate of close to 70% with the true CR rate of about 45%. And here again, responses are relatively quick within the first two months. And most of these people had a pretty high TP53 allele burden, as you see, 73% median. So these are the kind of real TP53 driven. And recently, we uh, started a IST study to say, well, azavan does seem to improve remission rates, at least in TP53, even though survival wasn't good, and azamagro looks good. So could we then combine these three drugs? This is, again, very early data uh, that we'll be presenting an update here at the ASH meeting on Sunday, but definitely for achieving a response in this older, unfit population, whether they're TP53 mutated or not, uh, we're seeing actually very encouraging remission rates, as you can see, and especially CR rates uh, that are in a very high range. But uh, we need, of course, more follow-up and time and TP53 allelic burden, really, to see what happens. Uh, but it looks like whether it's megrolimab, and it's not the only CD47, there's ALX, lemsoparlimab, trillium, others. So we hope that this will be an approach that improves the outcome, at least in TP53, uh, still will be a lot of work to be done because even with those, the median survival is still in the 12, 13 month uh, range. But at least we will hopefully have some steps forward. Another drug that has been quite exciting in the TP53 space is a drug called APR246. And this really works by impacting the folding of the TP53 protein, allowing P53 to remain functional. And uh, the initial phase two data sets that were presented, both of them in the JCO, by Dr. Salman and Dr. Clouseau, respectively, showed very encouraging true CR rates close to 50%. Uh, unfortunately, the phase three in MDS uh, read out as not meeting its primary endpoint, although the CR rate was increased 33% versus 22%, it did not meet a statistical significance. So the future of this drug is still in question. There are ongoing trials. I think many of us still believe that it has value and may be evaluated in different settings. And there's a nice composite analysis of the two phase twos going to be presented here in the ASH meeting that I would recommend to uh, check out. It's abstract number 246, uh, which will be on Saturday, showing again when you combine these phase two data sets, uh, the CR rate, CR, CRI rate, overall response rate was very, very uh, encouraging. And in fact, people who had TP53 higher allelic burden or isolated TP53 seemed to respond much better. And so maybe the selection for future randomized trials has to be more uh, objective, and uh, that could lead to some better outcomes. We will have to wait and see. So these are the key points. CPX351 venetoclax are both effective options, secondary AML. Uh, I think transplant is the key here. Whatever option you use, I think the same will hold true with megrolimab APR. I do not think at any near future we're moving away from transplant TP53. It's how we can get people into deeper remissions pre-transplant, and as Dr. Stein had mentioned, what we could potentially do post-transplant kind of the myeloma total therapy approach. TP53 uh, in general still remains a difficult group and there are emerging therapies uh, uh, that are coming. So we'll move on to the next uh, section and uh, I think we're actually on time here, great. So um, improving care with targeted therapies uh, in the frontline uh, setting and it'll be Dr. DiNardo and myself. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. DiNardo to go to the initial section. All right, so um, we have another patient. This is Kelly. She is 68 years old. Um, and you might actually say, why do we always choose people between the age of 65 and 70? And it does make for good cases. But remember that this is the median age of AML also. So a lot of our patients fit in this area. And so it's not just to create kind of controversy. It's these are the patients we see in clinic all the time. So 68-year-old patient presenting with a uh, history of hypertension, um, diabetes, a performance status, which is quite reasonable, zero to one. Um, she has on her bone marrow 72% blasts, a FLT3 ITD mutation with a large allelic ratio, 0 0.89. She also has NPM1 and DNMT3A mutations present and diploid cited genetics. And so... Um, Let's kind of go through some of the treatment options for our NPM1 and FLT3 mutated patient. So first, you know, I think we all um, know the RADIFI study. This was kind of the kind of instrumental study that showed adding a FLT3 inhibitor um, to intensive chemotherapy improves overall survival. Um, this was a study of over 700 patients over about a decade of analysis, and it showed you can see the four-year overall survival is improved by about seven to eight percentage points. Um, and particularly, again, looking at the, the graph over here of transplanted patients, 
those patients who go to transplant who were on the FLT3 inhibitor arm of mitostorin in blue, those patients are deriving kind of optimal benefit. And you can see long-term survival rates of about you know, 70% or so. So this is really encouraging in what used to be a very high-risk population. You will note the age along the top, 18 to 59 years, right? So this was a study kind of back in the you know, era of designing studies where intensive chemotherapy was really for people up into about the age of 60 for clinical trials. Um, and remember also, mitostorin is a type 1 inhibitor, so it works on both the ITD and the TKD, so both of those um, populations were eligible, and you can see that while kind of the um, hazard ratio is, is spanning one, that mitostorin treated um, patients appear to do um, uh, better with, with both low ITDs, high ITDs, and the tyrosine kinase domain mutation. So that is our current standard um, of, of intensive chemotherapy with mitostorin for FLT3 ITD mutated patients. Um, and there are many studies that are ongoing now trying to see if mitostorin um, is, um, is, is still the FLT3 inhibitor to be used or if second generation FLT3 inhibitors will replace mitostorin with increasingly um, optimal um, re remission rates, MRD negative remission rates, and overall survival. So this was a study that was presented by Keith Pratz at ASH last year. Um, of uh, standard intensive chemotherapy with gilteritinib um, at uh, various different escalation doses. And then you can see kind of at the expansion doses, gilteritinib of 120 milligrams is used for um, a two-week schedule during, during therapy. Um, moving into consolidation, again, gilteritinib for uh, 14 days and then into a maintenance um, in patients who either don't go to transplant or who do go to transplant, you then can restart gilteritinib post-transplant. And I, I don't think we're going to talk too much about that, but just know that that's a really important part of treatment of FLT3 ITD mutated patients. You want to make sure post-transplant that you're, you're putting them uh, on a FLT3 inhibitor maintenance. Various different subgroups um, in this um, uh, study was presented by, by Dr. Pratz, and along kind of the, the, the far um, area over here, you can see the 38 patients that were FLT3 mutated, um, a composite CRC of, a, of over 80%, and along the top, a, a um, disease-free survival of over a year overall, median overall survival that hasn't been reached, and the follow-up um, at that point was, was well over two years. Intensive chemotherapy causes uh, myelosuppression, so you um, are not surprised to see these are the, the major grade three and higher adverse events. Um, nothing really standing out in terms of, of differences with um, routine intensive chemotherapy. And so the, the kind of take home from, from this abstract was that the combination of uh, intensive chemotherapy with gilteritinib, we're seeing a composite uh, remission rate of over 80% with a true CR of 40%. The 120 milligram gilteritinib dose seems to be appropriate. Um, it didn't really matter. There were various different uh, intensive chemotherapy, different anthracyclines used, and, and responses seemed to be kind of similar regardless. Um, we saw high mutational clearance rates. So this is something that, you know, we don't have that data from the Ratify study. You know, how, how well are we clearing MRD, both in terms of flow and in terms of that FLT3 um, using highly sensitive assays? Um, and there are many um, uh, phase three studies, two in particular mentioned here, the HOVON and the PRECOG, which are further evaluating um, gilteritinib and intensive chemotherapy. And then um, a, another big newsworthy um, um, announcement was the Quantum First, which just uh, was a press release. This is all we have. You know, this is, we're sharing with you all we really know. But as of a couple of weeks ago, we know that of the 539 patients that were FLT3 ITD mutated, so this is not TKD. Uh, Quisartinib is a type 2 inhibitor, so it's specific for the ITD um, mutated patients. And, and look at the age range here, 18 to 75 years were eligible for intensive chemotherapy um, and uh, randomized to quizartinib or not. Um, and it led to a statistically significant and reportedly clinically meaningful improvement in overall survival. And so we are kind of eagerly awaiting this data, but it does appear um, that there will be combinations with FLT3 inhibitors um, in addition to mitostorin that hopefully will be available for us to use. So remember, our patient is 68 years old, right? So another thing we talk about a lot, and we've already talked about, is, well, should we be using 
lower intensity combinations now that we have effective uh, kind of lower intensity combinations with HMA then. Um, and this is the initial subgroup analysis looking at the various different um, kind of most common or most um, relevant uh, mutations. And you can see um, NPM1 and FLT3 are, are boxed in red because our patient has these mutations. Um, and while the hazard ratio for both of these, again, is crossing one, you can see it we're trending, at least, better uh, with, with the, the AZA-VEN combination. I think the FLT3 data with HMA-VEN is, is interesting, and you kind of have to go into it a little bit, so I'll kind of highlight here. So FLT3 mutated patients respond really well to HMA-VEN. You can see here clearly they're, you know, the CRCR8 CRCRI rate is, you know, 66 to 70 percent, um, looking at the various different, you know, ITD based on the size of the allelic ratio, um, whether they're NPM1, FLT3 co-mutated. So it's not an issue of getting patients into a remission. The FLT3 mutated patients go into lovely remissions. Um, and the overall survival is improved for FLT3 mutated patients. Um, but then when you start separating out, the numbers get small. So that is important when you're doing any of these, you know, subset, you know, analyses and trying to try and look. But you, but there does seem to be a difference between the FLT3 TKD mutations in blue who are deriving significant benefit from the HMA then and the FLT3 ITD patients. You're kind of losing that that clear benefit. It's there. The point estimate is there, but the median overall survival is less than a year, and so it's a good option. Um, but I'm not sure, you know, five years from now, this will be the best option for our older FLT3 mutated patients. Um, this is a study that was um, um, a, looking at um, patients that were treated with um, venetoclax combinations, a lot of lower, uh, low-dose ARC actually, with then from the Australia group. So they were looking at kind of how effective um, uh, VEN combinations were at eradicating NPM1 um, by highly sensitive MRD PCR. And you can see, um, Again, getting to that point that NPM1 mutated patients are really exquisitely sensitive to venetoclax combinations, with most patients becoming MRD negative, um, again, not just by flow, but by that, that PCR for NPM1. And so, you know, uh, we talked about AZAVEN for FLT3 mutated patients. This is an abstract that Nick Short from our group at, at Anderson is going to be presenting on Monday. Um, and this is uh, 26 patients so far that have been enrolled on AZAVEN and gilteritinib, right? So we know gilteritinib is effective in FLT3 mutated patients in the relapse setting. Uh, we know that AZAVEN is effective in FLT3 mutated patients, but we're not seeing optimal, um, durable, long-term overall survival. And so the question, of course, is can you put these together in a safe and effective way? Um, along the bottom, you know, some, some you know, teaser information from the abstract is that the composite remission rate is pretty impressive, 100% in the frontline setting, which is 11 of the 26 patients. Um, but note that, you know, dosing is different, right? So 120 of gilteritinib is what's used with intensive chemotherapy, but here we're optimizing at 80 milligrams of gilteritinib. And the venetoclax is shortened to like 14 days per cycle at the beginning, and then often as you move forward, it shortens even more. So I kind of am of two minds when I present triplet data because I think it's the future, and I think it's, you see improved deep remissions with this, but it's also more challenging to give, and we know that people have trouble, uh, you know, um, administering HMA VEN when this is not something they do routinely, you know, in, in some of the community groups. And so I think, I think figuring out how to optimize triplets is going to be a really important thing for kind of the, the academicians over, um, over the next few years. Um, and this is just, you know, additional, this is retrospective now looking at Anderson data of exactly this. So over, you know, over the years uh, using FLT3 inhibitors um, in, you know, uh, lower intensity combinations as a doublet and then it, in triplets in that lighter blue color by adding venetoclax, you can see, you know, along the bottom here, the composite remission rate, the PCR negativity, by that FLT3 mutation and then multi-parameter flow cytometry, you're clearly seeing deeper responses in patients getting the triplet. So that, there's no question there. Um, the issue is that, you know, is that going to lead to improved responses? And, you know, this slide is nice because you can actually see, you know, where treatment has gone. So this is first-generation FLT3 inhibitors in the green, so serafinib or mitostorin um, with lower-intensity therapy, and then second-generation with quizartinib or, or gilteritinib or 
Cronulla and Baby if we had some of those studies, and then, and then now the triplet. So the follow-up isn't nearly as long. Um, and we are a highly selective uh, our, uh, uh, you know, practice where we're following these patients really carefully. They're getting labs three times a week. You know, if they have a slight fever, they're admitted immediately. And so the question is, can we translate this into, into the community? Okay, so yeah, so I think that's a lot of exciting but early data that will be presented here at ASH. So I think back to this patient now, uh, so I think we may have put in more questions uh, than there were before as to what could be the optimum regimen. So just to recap, 68-year-old, 72% blast, high FLT3 allelic burden, and co-occurring NPM1 DNMP3, which is pretty common in FLT3. Uh, and so the questions are, what would you uh, select? Ratify time regimen, which is basically 7 plus 3 with mitostorin or with a FLT3 inhibitor, let's say, or a novel FLT3 inhibitor-based triplet uh, followed by transplant. Um, and uh, I think here we'll kind of open it up to a uh, question. I think, you know, this is another interesting area. And just to highlight, you know, when we say randomized data exists for a particular group, that may not be completely accurate either because the Ratify study was really only 18 to 59 years of age. So really there were no people above 60. Now the approval uh, actually says people are eligible for intensive chemo, but per se, there was no randomized set above 60 in the Ratify st study, unlike in the quantum first, which as Dr. Nardo mentioned, all we know is the press release so far that's publicly uh, disclosed, so we don't know the details, but that study did have 18 to 75. So we'll have to wait and see if that provides some randomized data in the 60 plus population. But I'll turn it here to Dr. Barade. So when you see such a patient, what are your thoughts and you know, how do you weigh the options? What would you do? So I, I think with this patient, um, I would say the, the option that I would probably discuss the most with her would be um, based on the Ratify study, given that she is fit and is a transplant candidate, would be admission for induction um, 7 and 3 in combination with mitostorin. We have a lot of data now um, on how patients do, the CRCRI rates, their progression to transplant, and Dr. DiNardo mentioned, um, and the fact that they get a lot of benefit once this happens. Um, I, I think the other thing that, you know, when, when you think of the lower intensity HMA VEN strategy, if you, again, look at the VLEA data that Dr. DiNardo discussed and the trial that she led, it's for a lot of groups, um, the CRCRI rates are, you know, very impressive, 75, 80% or higher, uh, but the FLT3 group just doesn't seem to do as well as does in the P TP53. And then last but not the least, um, I think the data from the Lace Wings trial, again, we don't have all the data yet, but the, the study where AZA as opposed to compared to AZA plus giltritinib was not a positive study. Just gives me a little bit of pause in the lower intensity option in a FLT3 positive fit patient. Um, and then the third thing is uh, these patients, again, are very proliferative. Their white counts are doubling every couple of days. Um, and so how necessarily to manage that with a lower intensity regimen, it probably would not be my first option. Okay. Dr. Stein, how would you... Uh approach this patient? Yeah, so, so thank you. I'd, I'd approach the patient very much like uh, Dr. Barate would. I would offer them intensive chemotherapy with uh, 7 plus 3 and mitostore. And I think the big issue is, which I, you just brought up, is what happens if we actually get the data from the Quisartinib trial, from the quantum first trial, and that data is positive. How positive is it going to have to be that Quisartinib is going to supplant mitostore? Because there's not going to be a head-to- or there isn't a head-to-head -head trial. So do we need, are we going to say, well, mitostorin compared to placebo showed a 7% survival difference at five years. If it's 15% in quantum first, different patient population, what are you going to do? And I think that's really going to be the challenge here. Yeah. And, and I think that's going to be, you know, as, as we often have to do a lot of analyses, comparative analyses, and, you know, there will be ITD allelic ratios. Do they matter? Age above 60, you know, all of these factors. And, you know, I mean, mitostorin also is not the easiest drug to give. Uh, for different reasons, and quizartinib has its own problems. So there may be a selection like we do with dasatinib, nilotinib, and CML, where is it a cardiac, is it a GI problem, you know, this person I would prefer one or the other. I think the nice thing is, you know, having those drugs obviously helps us then build new combinations, which, you know, will move things forward. Uh, the, the lace wing, you know, is an important study, I think, and it is going to be presented here at the ASH meeting by Dr. Eunice Wang. Uh, and as uh, Dr. Barati mentioned, it was negative uh, in the primary endpoint, although the remission rates were improved. 
And I think there's a lot of issues in how the patients were taken off, which we've seen now with ASA IDH studies as well, where you see the number of cycles on the HMA alone arm was uh, much long, much shorter. I think only two cycles compared to about four to five cycles on the ASA FLT3 because these are not placebo control blinded. And so I think once you do these studies where already the equipoise has been uh, shattered, where you know a FLT3 inhibitor is effective, people say, oh, I'll give them two cycles of ASA, take them off, give them FLT3 inhibitor. And I think those studies either should be powered for CR, MRD negative D, or EFS. Um, but, you know, at this point, unfortunately, that will go down as a, a negative study. The other important thing that I don't think we have here, but is probably more established is post-transplant maintenance, uh, just to bring that up. You know, I think uh, most of us would agree, and if not, you know, feel free to speak up, that if, however we get this person to transplant, we'd probably do a maintenance post-transplant. Uh, and here maybe I'll turn to Dr. Donardo and see how she approaches the post-transplant maintenance, which drugs she would use, and how long she's been routinely considering it for. Good question. Um, so first, before I even get there, this is patient is ELN intermediate, right, with the NPM1 mutation, despite that. So, so we could be up here saying, you know, risk-benefit ratio of transplant, but it seems like all of us are pretty, pretty um, uh, positive that we should be moving forward with transplant. That's certainly my I don't think we belief. really believe that they're ELN intermediate, even right. though it may be categorized that way in the ELN. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I agree. agree with doctors. I, I mean, I would yeah. probably go to transplant. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. And I think the ELN uh, will probably be uh, reshaped very much soon in the future. So, yeah. Yeah. so in terms of post-transplant um, FLT3, we, we like starting it as soon as we can. So as early as like 30 to 40, 45 days post-transplant, if their counts have recovered, if they have kind of adequate graft, um, and they don't have infections or ongoing cytopenia. So that's, there's a lot of people that can't start right away. But if you can, you know, I think the early relapses post-transplant with FLT3 mutated patients is what you have to worry about. So that's really where, you know, the, the post-transplant FLT3 inhibitor is helpful. Um, and I was actually, this came up in clinic just last week. So I was reviewing the data, data of how long to give FLT3 inhibitors as maintenance post-transplant. And it's, there's not you know, some say one year, some say two years, some say continue it as long as your patient is tolerating it. Um, I think, you know, the relapses with FLT3 ITD mutated patients do tend to be within the first year. So I think one year is important. I would probably do two years. Um, I think that's what the um, gilteritinib transplant, post-transplant um, study is, is, is designed for. Um, but if people are tolerating it well at the end of two years and they want to continue, I don't know that I would necessarily stop. But two years would probably be my answer. Yeah, and, and I think definitely post-transplant maintenance. You know, right now the data, randomized data, is out in the two randomized phase two studies is with sorafenib. And, and so I know a lot of people I talk to prefer to use that. Uh, giltritinib, there is a very large 400-plus patient randomized study that completed accrual and hopefully by the end of this year we'll have the data post-transplant setting in our experience, you know, we use sorafenib a lot at MD Anderson for the last decade, and, you know, tolerability-wise, at least, giltritinib has been a dramatic, not like subtle, it's been a dramatic difference post-transplant. I mean, I've had almost no patient where I've had to reduce doses or adjust. So if that holds true in the randomized study and the efficacy is met, I think it would not be a hard switch at all for us to, to move to giltritinib, which just seems uh, so much easier to uh, give post-transplant. And then I guess going back to the triplet uh, question, so what kind of data would be needed if one were to consider a triplet upfront? Would it have to be randomized data? Would it have to be multi-center phase two? Would we use PCR? I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Stein. What are your thoughts on what kind of data you'd need to consider using a HMA VEN FLT3 upfront instead of HMA VEN? Yeah, so I think uh, you know, from a purist perspective, you really wanna see randomized data, and I'll tell you why. You're going to see very high CR rates, which you're already seeing with these, with these combinations. But as we've learned in other studies, like in the P53 studies that were mentioned with Venaza, having a high CR rate doesn't necessarily translate into having superior overall survival. And especially when the toxicity of the regimen can lead to prolonged myelosuppression, which is what causes the demise of our patients, I do think that some sort of randomized trial um, is, is necessary. Now, there, there are practicalities that sometimes you can't do a randomized trial, you can't get enough patients, et cetera, et cetera. In that case, then a very, very well-designed um, phase two study with a good historical control arm is, would sort of be second best, I would guess. Yeah. Yeah, I, I actually personally think that it would require some form of randomized study as well, whether it's a randomized phase two or three, because 
you know, I think the big question is outside of the ultra large academic centers, right, where we can do labs three times a week, Neupogen, bone marrow on day 14, whatever is needed and adjust it. The question is, if you do it at 40, 50, 60 centers, you know, is this going to maintain that? Because I, I, I'm not concerned. The efficacy argument, I have no issue. I think it is very effective. I think the balance is that will you lose as much with the myelosuppression or not? And I think, you know, in a randomized fashion, if that can be shown, and as Dr. DiNardo mentioned, and that's what we want to tell the audience as well, people who are online, that this is not by any means a one plus one plus one. If you do one plus one plus one, these people will be ablated. You cannot give venetoclax 28 days with giltritinib 120 and HMA, and we know because in the phase one we tried and everybody gets very, very myelosuppressed. So I think there's still a work in progress and you know, you have to adjust doses and eventually probably some form of randomized information will be needed. But I think we'll move on here, do this slide. So we kind of discussed this, uh, the recommendations. Uh, I think the quantum first data is very eagerly awaited, hopefully early next year, because then there will be a lot of, a good thing to have options, but a lot of discussion about that. And then I think triplets as mentioned is encouraging and hopefully there'll be more mature data and uh, potential randomized studies coming in the near future. You know, one of the things you may have noticed is we're actually talking a lot about transplants. So people ask us, are you transplanting people less? We actually looked at this at MD Anderson and we we're transplanting a little bit more in the last three to four years than we did 10 years ago. So I don't want people to feel that these novel, we're not in ALL territory. The, I think we're two decades away from that where we may actually be able to reduce or avoid transplant. Right now, we're just happy to get more people in a deep remission to transplant, you know, which is hopefully gonna improve their potential for survival. So just kind of a takeaway point. So I will turn it back to Dr. DiNardo and we'll go maybe shorter through this section. Yes, I, so we've talked a lot about this already, I think. Mitostorin is not the easiest FLT3 inhibitor to tolerate. Um, uh, we've gotten good at using it, um, but, but GI effects, uh, rash, LFTs, um, are, are a challenge. With giltritinib and, and quizartinib, there's the concern for QT prolongation, um, more myelosuppression, and then transaminitis, hepatic um, issues. And so things to be aware of, make sure you're monitoring LFTs, for instance, on the, on the second generation FLT3 inhibitors. So yeah, we'll go through, I guess, uh, so the same patient, really, the big change here is no FLT3 mutation, uh, but has an NPM1 DNMT3A, and the question is, how would that impact our treatment decision? Would we consider venetoclax-based regimen or intensive chemotherapy with or without venetoclax? Yeah, and we've talked a lot about kind of HMA then already, but just kind of this is a 68-year-old who is fit. Um, and with, with HMA then again, you know, NPM1 mutated patients, we, we already kind of mentioned that, you know, the, that, um, HMA then, you, you do see very impressive MRD negativity um, and, and sensitivity with, with HMA then. Um, the one other thing I will, I will highlight is, um, you know, NPM1 mutated patients respond very well to then. But venetoclax was approved in AML um, with HMA and uh, has been, you know, the change the standard of care for our older chemo-ineligible patients, but that doesn't necessarily mean venetoclax can't work with intensive chemotherapy, and venetoclax, as we all know, synergizes really well with a lot of different therapies, and so um, there are many different venetoclax with other chemotherapies that are being evaluated, um, and there's kind of a, a larger seven and three with venetoclax moving forward in, in a cooperative group setting. Um, we have opened, um, you know, several other intensive chemotherapy combinations with then and this one with Flagida, um, our fellow Curtis Lakowitz will be presenting on Monday um, with an updated frontline cohort um, uh, efficacy results now of, of over 40 patients with a composite uh, remission rate of, you know, over 80%. Over 90% of patients who are responding are becoming MRD negative um, by, by standardized flow cytometry at our institution. Um, and you can see kind of that teaser bullet along the bottom, patients with NPM1 mutations, IDH mutations, KMT2A rearranged uh, mutations. In, in the frontline setting, these patients, um, none of them actually to date have, have relapsed and they've done incredibly well. So um, I think venetoclax with intensive chemotherapy is going to be another important thing, um, avenue for, for us to develop over the coming years. Okay, so I think we'll move forward here, uh, looking at the post-remission options. So so let's assume this patient got intensive chemo here with or without venetoclax, achieved remission, and 
does not, so this is important here. For maintenance, this is critical that these are not patients where we randomize them to transplant versus maintenance. You'll see the Quasar data in a second. But it's really patient who could not go to transplant for some reason. Either there's no donor, which is not common, but sometimes happens, logistical, financial reasons, patient preference. We do have patients still uh, who don't want to go to transplant, uh, or they had severe infection toxicity during their chemo and then were initially a transplant candidate and are not. And I think that's where we're kind of discussing, you know, what are the options for post rate remission maintenance therapy in AML. Uh, this is the uh, data here from the uh, Quasar study. Um, uh, sorry, this is the NCCN guidelines looking at different maintenance options. As you can see, it includes a lot of things, but when we talk about randomized data, there's really only one randomized data set uh, available. The only study that in a phase three randomized setting uh, in AML uh, recently has shown maintenance benefit. And you can see the overall survival here is 25 months versus 15 months. RFS was significantly increased as well. And the key though here I want to make is when we talk about maintenance, for example, in diseases like myeloma or ALL, this is a different kind of outcome that we're hoping, right? We're talking about people who will be disease-free survival at the rate of 90, 95% long-term. So here, this is really prolonging the remission. It's almost, in some way, a very prolonged consolidation, but I don't think we can really claim that we are curing a big subset of these patients. And so I think the question still is, how can we potentially improve this? And of course, there are combinations, just like we discussed with EPX, of oral ASA and oral decidabine, which, as you know, is approved in MDS, but may have a role eventually in AML, with venetoclax, IDH, FLT3, CD47, and others. Uh, the, I think the big key here that probably led to the success in Quasar was this was a very well-tolerated drug. You have to also remember, uh, uh, for a lot of the community and others who are practicing, that this only delivers about 30 to 40% by equivalence of uh, the ASA IV, meaning that you're not really getting full doses. You're getting only one-third of IV uh, ASA cytidine, what it would have given you. So I don't think we're ready to use this in the frontline setting in combination with venetoclax, IDH, FLT3. I think that's a great area for clinical trials, but this is not the same, and that may be why this was so much better tolerated than giving IV ACE or decidabine, because you're giving a small amount over time, prolonged, and that's giving you a maintenance benefit. Now, there are GI issues. We've seen those. Usually with dose reduction adjustment, giving a small interruption, that seems to help, and this is now approved for continued treatment of patients with AML in CRCRI following intensive induction who are not able to complete intensive curative treatment, but basically people who are not able to make it a transplant after finishing uh, induction consolidation. So this is the data with NPM1. This is a subset that was presented here, and here you see that even in the NPM1 patients who finished induction consolidation as planned by their treating physician and then got maintenance, there was a clear survival improvement. So we would use this in an NPM1 mutated patient, such as the one we discussed, if for some reason she could not make it a transplant. And here one could really even argue if she does not have a FLT3 and she has only an NPM1 without an adverse mutation, you may or may not want to transplant that patient. And we'll maybe talk about that towards the end. And so here, I think it would be a really good discussion as to whether one could just do maintenance versus transplant, again, not without randomized data in that uh, setting, but a good option. Because I think this is, this is key. I think, you know, this is a really big difference, right? So these curves are hard, you know, but just look at the solid lines, and these are the NPM1 mutated patients. Um, and the blue is the ones who had oral ASA. So for me, you know, when I'm trying to find the optimal patient to use oral ASA, it's kind of a niche population, right? The people that aren't going to transplant, that are going to benefit from, from oral ASA maintenance, and I feel like the NPM1 mutated patients are, are the ones deriving really significant benefit. Yeah, I agree. So maybe I can ask here, actually, to Dr. Barade, you know, if you have such a patient, NPM1 isolated, or with, let's say, the NMT3A, who's 68, intensive chemo, would you push for transplant here, or would you consider maintenance options today? What's so I, I think this is, this is a hard question because I think there's data, retrospective data from a large cohort of um, alliance protocols showing that NPM1 positive AML in patients older than 60 is still not really considered favorable like an NPM pa NPM1 positive patient younger than 60 who gets intensive therapy and gets consolidation. So I think to Dr. DiNardo's point, um, I would absolutely send the patient for a transplant consult, but after discussion of the risks and benefits of transplant, if the decision is made not to go to transplant, then that is the patient that will get benefit from an oral ASA maintenance strategy. 
Yeah. No, I agree. I think these are, yeah, absolutely. I think if the patient felt very concerned or had a reservations, I would not, you know, be pushing that much in this case, as opposed to a flip three case where I think we would really want to consider transplant. So, so it's a good option here to have. Okay, so we'll turn over here to the relapse refractory ML setting where we have the pleasure of Dr. Stein from uh, uh, MSKCC at New York, and we'll turn it over to him, and we'll do all the question answers in the end, so please continue to send your questions. I think we'll have probably around 15 minutes, so we should be able to get to them. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I just want to make a general comment of how lucky we are that we have all of these drugs to play with yeah. and for our patients. I can't imagine, what was it like when our bosses were up here? They were talking about like GCSF priming for seven and three or something like that. So I, it, it, we should step back and recognize that we live in a time that we have amazing options, all of which are becoming more amazing by the month or by the day maybe. Okay, so, so we're going to... Dr. Stein, I think that's why we're much happier than many of our bosses. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay, yeah. Go ahead, okay. go ahead. <laughs> um, so Kelly's case revisited. What if she received FLIP3 inhibitor-based induction, then a hematopoietic stem cell transplant? So again, Kelly is a 68-year-old patient presenting with hypertension, diabetes, performance status of 0 to 1, 72% blast, FLIP3 ITD, NPM1, DNMT3A, normal cytogenetics. She gets Ratify um, regimen, then a stem cell transplant, and then she relapses. And when she relapses, she has 60% blasts, normal karyotype, still has the FLT3 ITD. So the question is, uh-oh, this patient has just relapsed, um, and uh, what are we going to do now? Okay, so there are a few things that are important to note. So one thing that's important to note is that you need to do repeat FLT3 testing. The reason is because FLT3 mutations that were present at the time of diagnosis may not be present at the time of relapse. And if they were not present at the time of diagnosis, they may be present at the time of relapse. There's about a 30% disconnect between diagnosis and relapse of whether a FLT3 mutation is there or is not there. So it's always important to repeat the FLT3 mutation testing. You can see here that illustrated, you can also see that sometimes the FLT3 ITD can be longer, it can be shorter, it can be slightly different. So what are options for relapsed and refractory AML with FLT3 mutations? So these are the NCCN guidelines. You can see that for therapy for AML with a FLT3 ITD, the NCCN says giltaritinib is category one. And then they also list hypomethylating agents and serafinib as a potential option. Giltaritinib is listed as category one based on the results of the ADMIRAL trial. The ADMIRAL trial, as you know, is a randomized controlled trial where patients were randomized to receive either giltaritinib or salvage chemotherapy after they had relapsed with FLT3 positive acute myeloid leukemia. You can see the median overall survival, even with longer follow-up, shows that giltaritinib maintains its benefit with a median OS of 9.3 months compared to 5.6 months in the group of patients who receive salvage chemotherapy. However, you'll also notice that at the tail of the curve, those lines at about two years start to come together. Now, we do have novel targeted doublets that make clear the FLT3 allelic burden in FLT3 mutated relapsed and refractory AML. We talked a little bit about newly diagnosed AML. Here we're talking about relapsed and refractory AML, where you can see in this abstract that's being presented um, at ASH, this is a, a study that combined VEN400 with GILT120 in patients with FLT3 mutated relapsed and refractory AML. The uh, composite complete remission rate was 74.5%, prior TKIs 78%, prior venetoclax 60%. And then you can see on the right-hand side that the group of patients who had clearance of their FLT3 allelic burden to a very, very low level did better than the patients who didn't have clearance of their FLT3, suggesting, as, as many of us know, that the achievement of an MRD negative state, perhaps even in the relapsed and refractory setting, is important and something we should be aiming for. So let's move back now to Kelly. So what are the options now for Kelly in the setting that we talked about before where she has relapsed FLT3 AML? Single agent FLT3 inhibitor like giltaritinib, serafinib, or giltaritinib combination, what would you think? <laughs> 
So yeah, I mean, from our experience, you know, at Anderson, we're definitely much more eager with the combinations at this time, especially when the goal is to get them to transplant. You know, as you saw with venetoclax gilteritinib, there's similar data with quizartinib, uh, HMA ven combos. You know, the remission rates are very high, but same issue is myelosuppression. So if we're doing it for a finite period to get somebody to transplant, I think it's a great option. That's where we'd use it. Now, if you're going to do it in a 73-year-old for long term, it's a, it's a little bit more difficult. And I think you have to really start adjusting the venetoclax using growth factors. Uh, but that's kind of been our approach. And a lot of it is on trial. But even off trial, I would probably go for a combo if I'm trying to push quickly for a transplant option. But uh, Dr. Borati, what, what are your op approaches? No, I, I agree. I think um, that the goal is to get this patient to transplant clear uh, her marrow of disease as soon as possible and has been discussed, preferably MRD negative disease. And I think the data that you're going to present um, in the upcoming meeting and you've already presented prior is very encouraging as to how quickly patients sort of get rid of their disease, including at an MRD negative level. So um, I, I think that would be a great option. Yeah. Any other thoughts, Dr. Stein, Dr. DiNardo? I mean, I'm a bit torn. This patient has already had a transplant, right, and relapsed. And so, you know, the chances of a successful second transplant are there. I mean, it's, it's, it's a reality, but it's, it's low. Um, she's, she's NPM1 mutated. Um, and so, so, again, kind of speaking to the venetoclax sensitivity, you know, adding then to, to gilteritinib makes, makes sense to try to kind of get her back into a remission. Um, but but long-term tolerability of that could be, could be a challenge and whether or not you know, she would be appropriate for a second transplant. Yeah, so. and I think one other option that we have done a lot of Anderson is often maybe starting with a combo, yeah. getting a remission, yeah. MRD, one or two cycles, and then you yep. go on to giltritinib alone or really like five, seven days of then. So yeah, I think it's a work in, in progress, but I think in the relapse, there's more push because we know outcomes are bad to kind of move with these combos than the front line where I think short of randomized data, it's going to be hard to convince groups and, to do and that. And to Dr. DiNardo's point, once these patients that have had a transplant, you get control of their disease, their graph really comes back well. That's true. They recover their accounts well. Sometimes they even have, you know, GVHD. So we, we, they may not need that much therapy to sort of get back where they need to be. We had a very interesting patient of actually Dr. DiNardo's. I think we published that case report, right? Yeah, where we he was on single agent uh, giltritinib post transplant. Mm -hmm. Flip three was coming up. We added Ven for one or two cycles. Went back into MRD negative PCR clearance, and then, as you said, it seemed like the donor chimerism and graft came in, and then yeah. he's done well yeah. a few years later. So there's yeah. some interesting things post transplant that I think we may not factor completely. But yeah, I'll turn it back to you, Dr. Stein. Okay. So um, the recommendations would be that based on the current standard, based on Randomized phase three data is giltaritinib, obviously followed by a stem cell transplant, if that can be achieved. There is emerging doublet data that suggests that venetoclax plus giltaritinib could induce high remission rates and molecular clearance, as, as we just showed. And then this option could be considered followed by uh, another stem cell transplant, although as, as we've all just mentioned, second transplants are tough. The patients tend to have a rough time with those. So we'll go back here to this case now, and, and we're going to make a little bit of a change. So 68-year-old patient, had similar history, got intensive chemo flit 3, went into remission, got transplant, now relapses, and as Dr. Stein very nicely showed, and that's one of about two or three data sets that have shown now you could lose up to 50% of people could lose their flit 3 So that's not uncommon. Uh, a little bit of a stretch here we're making just for the case where the patient has an IDH1 mutation. That doesn't really happen as much, rarely, but let's just, uh, for the sake of argument, say that this patient now has an IDH mutation uh, present but does not have a FLT3. So what would we do for a relapsed IDH mutated patient post-transplant, basically? Yeah, so, so the, you can see the NCCN recommendations. Yes, the NCCN has all sorts of recommendations. One of them is... Um, that the therapy for AML with an IDH1 mutation is the only IDH1 inhibitor that's approved um, named ivocidinib. That, that should not be a surprise to anyone. Um, but I think this is the interesting data. And the interesting data is we know that in the relapsed and refractory setting, ivocidinib is a good drug. It has a median duration of response of about six months. Courtney and I, and maybe both of you, share patients, we don't share patients, but we all have patients that were on the original IDH1 inhibitor trials, and I've got a patient now who is just cycle 84 day one. Yep. 
So there is a subset of patients who can actually achieve long-term disease-free survival with targeted IDH1 inhibition alone. But the issue is that that's not the rule. The rule is that most patients will end up relapsing. Um, this is a very, very nice abstract that's being published by um, doc, doc, or presented by Dr. Lakowitz, and this is a Courtney's group, looking at the role for doublet and triplet therapy in IDH1 mutant AML, giving ivocidinib and venetoclax plus or minus azacitidine. You can see that there are very, very high rates of remission. You can see um, there are, you know, small numbers of patients, but their survival curves on the right-hand side suggest that giving the triplet may be better than giving, um, than giving a doublet. And this is something that I think is very, very exciting. I think the challenges here are, do you have to prove this in a randomized setting? And if you do, how exactly do you do that? Because the remission rates with all of these agents tend to be quite high. But I think this is very, very interesting data. So going back to the, the same patient here, so, in a, so we're basically looking at different relapse settings. So we talked about FLIP3 relapse. We talked about IDH relapse, where again, in both, I think the consensus is that single agent is good, it's approved, but we would like to move to the combos and data is emerging and hopefully, you know, we'll be using those more as we optimize them. But what about if the patient has no targetable mutation, which is in reality still the big group, you know, 70%, 60 to 70% of people will not have a targetable mutation. And of course, the definition of targetable mutation is changing because Dr. Stein will later talk about new targets for which we now consider targeted therapies. But what would be the salvage options in this non-mutational targeted group, Dr. Stein? Yeah, so, um, you know, there are a number of, well, let's go back for a second. I think that a, a number of years ago, all of us, not all of us, but maybe most of us up here would have said, we're gonna give those patients reinduction chemotherapy with, you know, vera, you know choice of therapy, CLAG, mitoxantrone, or FLAG-IDA, you know, I don't know, you make it up. So. Um, put a bunch of chemotherapy together, put them in the hospital, that's the only thing that's going to put them into remission. Um, we don't really do that anymore. And I would say before we even jump into this, one of the things we do for patients who have received intensive chemotherapy and then relapsed is we give them azaven. And I don't know if that's the right thing to do because we don't actually have randomized studies in that setting, but we all do it because we all think that azaven has activity even in the relapsed and refractory setting, especially for patients with maybe intermediate and favorable risk cytogenetics. So there are a number of immunotherapy options that are in development for AML with applications in relapsed and refractory disease. There's IMGN632, uh, which is an, an antibody drug conjugate against CD123. Flotituzumab, which is a 123 CD3 bispecific. You can see all of these, all the other four are bispecifics. And the basic idea of the bispecifics, instead of just reading out their names, is that they have an arm that attaches to a T cell, they have an arm that attaches to a myeloid cell, and that allow the, the close affinity of the T cell to the myeloid cell leads to death of the myeloid cells. So this is um, the, the 180C, IMGN632. This is a triplet study that's going to be presented by Dr. Daver. And it was a study that was designed to determine the safety, tolerability, and activity of 632 when combined with AZA and VEN in CD123 positive AML. You can see the overall response rate is quite high at 55%. Composite complete remission rate of 31%. It was generally well tolerated with no capillary leak. We worry about that with CD123 targeted agents. And then you see these waterfall plots on the right, which are impressive, showing that you're getting blast clearance. And some of those blast clearances um, in the dark blue color are blast clearances that are complete remissions. Now, after, uh, after this talk, I'm going, to be, uh, I'm going to be testing everyone on what these things look like. I can ask you to write them down for me. So just kidding, of course. So the, the point of this is to show you that there are a lot of different ways and a lot of different things you can build that target CD3 and CD33, CD3, CD123. I am not an expert on which one of these, of these um, constructs does a better job, um, but it's important to note that we have different constructs and they have different names. Bites, darts, diabodies, tandem diabodies, they're all sort of doing a very, very similar thing. One of those is a drug called flotituzumab, the DART, that great name that targets CD123 and CD3. Again, an investigational bispecific molecule that co-engages T cells with tumor-associated CD123, and it redirects the T cells 
to kill the tumor cells. I think this is the data that was presented, I think, last year or two years ago. Again, it's being presented this year at ASH, showing that flotituzumab may be a great salvage immunotherapy option. The thing that got everyone's attention with this data is that among 30 patients with primary induction failure, so these are patients who have failed two intensive courses of indu induction chemotherapy, by giving this single-agent flotituzumab, there was a rate of CR and CRH that was 26.7%. Impressive. I think that's impressive. The question is, what's the tolerability of a drug like this? How many of these patients get to transplant? And of course, the real question is, what's going to be the long-term survival of patients like this? There may be other modalities. These are other two major approaches, antibody drug conjugates or adaptive or innate immune system harnessing therapies, the bispecific antibodies, the immune checkpoint inhibitors. There are ideas about doing CAR T cells, CAR NK cells. Now there's high volume NK cells. And then of course, vaccines. We've got some experience with vaccines now. For other diseases, maybe they can be turned into vaccines for cancer therapy. Back okay. to you. So I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, compared to a few years ago, there's a lot of progress in general in immunotherapy. So I think a lot of efforts ongoing, but it's still kind of early days uh, in the AML. I do agree with the flotituzumab. The primary induction failure is probably the most intriguing set, and it'll be good to see with more patients and follow-up, you know, if that holds up, uh, uh, because that's a group where repeat intensive chemotherapy or even HMA ven does have limited activity. And so if we have other drugs that we could potentially use or combine, I think that would be a very good option. I did want to bring up a little bit about the HMA then in relapse setting, because I think that's actually a good point. Even though there's no randomized data set, it is, there are about three or four papers uh, published now showing that you could get anywhere between 30 and 50% responses, especially as you said, in the intermediate non-TP53 non-complex. And it's, you know, something we've used um, quite a bit. Uh, so Dr. DiNardo, what kind of patients would you use in HMA VEN in relapse setting? Is, is there a particular phenotype or? Yeah, the, the patients that respond the best to HMA VEN in the frontline setting are the ones that are going to potentially respond in the salvage setting. Um, so, so that's NPM1, IDH, uh, maybe splicing, um, even RUNCS, there's, there's some data that RUNCS1 patients quite, can be quite sensitive. So I think kind of having intermediate cited genetics, diploid in particular, but otherwise intermediate cited genetics and some of those kind of um, more VEN favorable uh, mutations are, are uh, you have a probably a greater than uh, around a 50% or so chance of a response, you know, a, an overall response. I do have a quick follow-up question. Do you usually change the HMA in that setting if they've been exposed to it before? Are you doing 10-day to cytobine? Um, we often will change up the HMA just to feel like we're doing something different, whether that actually matters. I don't know. I mean, there's data that there's like a 10% chance of yeah. response from one versus the other. I, I don't change the HMA just to make the point to the junior faculty that there's no good data about that. So, <laughs> Although yeah. this is not an MDS talk, I will say that, you know, I've had, you know, quite a, a, a few now anecdotal MDS patients that have been on azacitidine without response, and then I'll add venetoclax, and, and then all of a sudden that I'll works, see yeah. a response. Agreed. And so Absolutely. it really, you don't have to change the AM, HMA to Absolutely. see. To yeah, see I agree. I, I don't, because many years ago, Dr. Borthak and our faculty looked at, you know, just changing HMAs that had mm -hmm. and it was it like minuscule, 5% yeah. or something, which is probably just people with delayed responses, really. Right. So, but I think that's why you'll see, you know, because as you said, if you have a first salvage patient without complex carrier TP53, HMA VEN is still a good option. And I think that's where developing new drugs, you know, the, would you compete with HMA VEN? And I think it's hard. If you have an antibody that gives you 25, 30% response, I may say, you know, I'll just give HMA VEN. And I think that's why the way may be to combine them potentially. Now, the real question will be, let's say some of those randomized studies looking at HMA VEN in younger 50 to 70 intermediate populations eventually come out and say that it's equal or better then maybe we'll be using more and more HMA up front, and then we'll need other options salvage. So a lot of things moving that will change in the near future. But I'll turn it. Uh, so now we'll do the same patient. We said FLT3 mutated, IDH mutated, no targetable mutation. But now there is actually a new group of potentially targetable subsets, uh, which let's say this patient had an MLL rearrangement, which is uh, usually a very adverse group. But uh, Dr. Stein will talk about some of the target approaches, and they may work for both MLL and NPM1. So we'll go ahead with the MLL. Yeah, so let me just go back for a second. 
Yeah, so, so this is something I'm very excited about. Um, targeted therapy against MLL rearrangement. So um, there is great preclinical data. Now we have great clinical data. There's great preclinical data showing that when you have an MLL rearrangement or an NPM1 mutation, so together that occupies probably 40% of patients with AML and a subset of patients with ALL, right? Because MLL rearrangements occur in ALL also. So when you have that rearrangement, what happens is that this macromolecular complex, which you can see in the dark blue, requires a protein called menin in order to, to cause leukemogenesis. So it's the binding of menin to that macromolecular complex that leads to Hox gene upregulation and the development of acute leukemia. So there are now small molecule inhibitors. The one I'm showing you here is from a company called Syndex. There are others from Cura, Daiichi, j and I think Biomia is going to have one where you can give a small molecule inhibitor that blocks the protein-protein interaction between menin and this macromolecular complex. And I think what's really exciting, and we're going to update this data on Monday, is that in this phase 1-2 study called Augment 101, among 54 patients uh, that were treated, not all of those are efficacy evaluable. Some of them are in what's called a safety cohort. Some of them are in the efficacy cohort. But be it as it may, the rate of composite complete remission is 44% in the relapsed and refractory setting. And um, the rate of CR and CRH is 22%. There are two different arms in this, in this uh, study. There's an arm for patients taking strong CYP384 inhibitors, an arm for patients not taking strong CYP384 inhibitors. You're all familiar with that because of your experience with venetoclax, where you have to play around with doses of medications, whether patients on a strong azole antifungal or not. When it comes to the safety of the drug, this drug is extraordinarily safe. There, there has been talk about this QT prolongation. Uh, you'll see here that there were a number of patients who had prolongation of the QT. I'm going to give you my, the unvarnished truth about what I think about QT prolongation. So, you know, in, in clinical practice, these patients have acute myeloid leukemia and are likely to succumb to their disease. If their QT is 483, you know, okay, their QT is 483. And maybe we stop some drugs and try to get it a little bit lower. But ultimately, a drug that may produce a small rise in QT is still a drug that I would gladly grab for. The other thing we look for in, in um, studies like this is the occurrence of differentiation syndrome. Um, you may know that there was one compound that has been put on a partial FDA hold because of a death that was thought to be attributed to differentiation syndrome. Um, I think that with the early recognition of differentiation syndrome, this shouldn't be a problem. If it was a problem, we never would have gotten drugs approved like Atra and Arsenic for acute promyelocytic leukemia. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I totally agree. I think the menin inhibitors are, are a major, looks like breakthrough. Hopefully, many different combinations we can do with them. And I think we'll have to figure out, you know, what are the differences between different menin inhibitors like the FLIP3 inhibitors and can we use them sequentially? And of course, eventually, can we combine them quickly, move them up front like we're doing with FLIT3, IDH, and TP53 directed therapy? So, uh, and then there'll be a test in the end. We're going to ask you to draw the menin complex, the <laughs> immune antibody complexes, and then the Krebs cycle, the last one. <laughs> All right. But are we going to ask people who is non confident and doesn't know what they are? I mean, that that's right. Who can, who can draw the it? The people who really might, we might need to talk to them afterwards so that they, you know. I think the panel here would be non confident <laughs> yeah. for We might yeah. be not confident. Yeah. Yeah. I know what my answer will yeah. be. So, yeah, so I think we have some time for question answers. I'm, I have I've received some questions um, from our team, so I'm going to kind of throw them out to our group here. So one of the questions I thought was interesting, let's say you have, the question is, what do you treat people with IDH2 and TP53, let's say with an ECOG of 2? But I'm going to put it in, a, let's say, a frontline patient who's 69 or 70 years, let's say 75 years, and has IDH and TP53 mutation. What would you choose for this patient? Uh, let me start with Dr. Barade. So I think it depends on what IDH mutation. As Dr. Stein said, Ivocidinib is approved as single agent frontline for newly diagnosed patients with an IDH1 mutation. We all know, you know, TP53 mutations generally mean a pretty poor prognosis. We yet don't have a TP53 targeted therapy. So in a patient with a poor performance status, I would either start 
um, HMA then, depending on how the patient was doing, um, if I could sort of get to a better performance status, control their white blood count maybe, or do single agent ivocidinib if um, the patient had an IDH1 mutation. Dr. Denardo? I, so we actually have, um, we're actually putting together an analysis right now of this specific question, IDH and P53 mutations, because they're quite rare, but they happen, um, even in the front line, um, more frequently in the, in the relapse setting. Um, and the question is, you know, it, it, can you overcome P53 resistance with a more favorable IDH mutation in terms of venetoclax sensitivity or the IDH inhibitors? Um, are they particularly effective in P53? Um, you know, the, the original IDH inhibitor monotherapy studies in the relapse setting, you would see, you know, um, responses in P53 mutated patients. Um, and and we, don't, we don't have kind of that long-term survival by specific co-mutation to, to know, but my suspicion is they don't do as well because P53 mutated patients just don't do as well. Um, I would actually be, um, this would be a population of patients in the frontline setting. I would be very interested in doing either aza Enna or aza ivo There's the agile data that we'll be, we'll be seeing later um, this meeting because I really think venetoclax is not helpful in P53 mutated patients. Right, and I think, I think, that, I think your last point is, the, is uh, important, which is that you know, they are presenting the agile data today, randomized placebo-controlled trial of IVO azacitidine versus azacitidine placebo for newly diagnosed IDH1 mutant AML. I am hoping that the investigators, I don't think any of us were on that, I'm hoping the investigators uh, did some subset analyses because they will have P53 IDH1 mutant patients. And, you know, if those patients suddenly did really well, that might be a good option for them. I doubt they did, but... Yeah, <laughs> no, we've seen this, you know, I mean, because and we've treated some of them on CD47 Magro, and I actually don't think they do as well with that either when they have a TP53 and IDH. So it's a tricky question. Now, I mean, of course, the trial we would try maybe is a Ven Magro. That's a great option. You have both. But I probably would lean towards an IDH option, whether it's Aza Ven or Aza Ven IDH or Aza IDH. I think that, that is, uh, you know, something that can be debated. But, yeah. So let's see. And if see. they do respond, it will be relatively short-lived, most likely. So if they're transplant eligible, trans yep. try to sure. get them into a nice deep response and take them yeah. to transplant. I think that is, uh, yeah, non-debatable would be to get them to transplant very quickly. So another um, question here is, um, can Azaven be a substitute for intensive chemo? What trials are... Uh, looking at this. I'll turn it to Dr. Barade. I think you had mentioned. Yeah, so I think this, that is the question of the, the year or the next five years or the next you know, 10 years, however you want to look at it. Um, I think a lot of us are doing that sometimes on a case-by-case -case basis. I do know that there are several trials, both in the cooperative group setting and in large academic centers that are looking exactly at this question, whether comparing patients that would have otherwise been eligible for upfront 7 plus 3 um, and comparing them to um, ASAVEN. And I know that those trials are in the process of starting up. If not, some centers might already be enrolling those patients. I know we will be participating in one such trial um, pretty soon. So I, I think Without that sort of randomized trial, it's a hard question to answer. We all have our biases. We've talked about that extensively in this, um, in, in this forum. I'm not afraid to tell you my bias. <laughs> um, so, I, so I agree that we need data. But if I was going to predict, which is a hazardous thing to do, I think five years from now, standard induction, standard induction therapy for intermediate and high-risk AML is going to be azovenetoclax. I think the favorable risk patients may still get intensive chemotherapy with 7 plus 3, but I really think that the 7 plus 3 we've been giving to everyone is going to, is going to go away. It's going to be reserved for later lines of therapy. I feel so confident about this that if you come up to me at a meeting in five years and I'm wrong, please tell me that I was wrong. <laughs> I will buy you a drink. I think one thing that's, <laughs> that's really interesting of the Flagida Venn data that will be presented by Curtis is how well ELN adverse patients do. Um, you know, favorable patients do well regardless. Um, but, but it seems by adding venetoclax, you're really kind of improving the outcomes of not P53 mutated patients, but otherwise ELN adverse. And so I would love to see like a well done, you know, intensive chemo versus intensive chemo with Ven versus Azaven, because I feel like no matter 
what comes of it, it's not going to be standard intensive chemotherapy yeah. anymore, to your point. Right, and, and I think that's the thing, right? We, it's neither arm is static, and, you know, the question is uh, flag-eyed event versus A's event. I think I would then buy you a drink, each time <laughs> because I think flag-eyed event would win. Absolutely. A's event versus. So, because, it just I mean, depends we've if you're the taking data, them to transplant. Cause if you take them transplant. So I think the question is really what people consider standard of care. Yeah. If it's 3 plus 7, absolutely, I agree with you. A's event will in the intermediate, high-risk, 50-plus yep. population, which is kind of where the trials are, I would be surprised if, you know, just the early mortality itself is going to pull the 3 plus 7. But if you have flag-eyed event, I mean, at least the data we've seen and the experience has been very, very uh, exciting. So I think we'll have to see how those studies are done and what emerges. But that's actually the next question, which is kind of getting at that, is what is the optimal therapy for a known FLT3 AML who's 60 years old and fit? 7 plus 3 GILT or then is a plus or minus FLT3 inhibitor. And I think that's the same question is that, you know, here again, if you say we're going to do flag IDA or intensive chemo guilt versus, which is not the standard today, but we hope it'll be better than MIDO versus A's Ven, again, we don't know. It, it probably, I think, could beat MIDO plus 3 plus 7 in HMA Ven guilt, but would it beat intensive chemo with guilt? I don't know. So I think those are the things which we may come back five years from now and say, you know, yeah, we beat that standard of care, like we're saying with the quantum first, where it beat 3 plus 7, but would have been better than 3 plus 7 mito. I don't know, but it's a great problem to have. And, and I think that, but it gets to the point that in order to, to answer any of these questions, we need to do well-designed, randomized clinical trials that open quickly. These trials have to get open quickly. They can't be sitting forever percolating because by the time they're done, the standard of care has changed. And that's where we need, I think, partnership from governmental agencies, from pharma, to, uh, to really help us accelerate um, the trials that are gonna be done to answer these questions. Yeah. And, and, and I, as you kind of mentioned, I think you know, doing really good molecular, and now not just molecular, we have great tools, you know, site off single cell. When we're doing these studies, you know, we shouldn't just be answering one question, which unfortunately is how things have happened for the last three decades, is to, okay, let's say it's positive or negative, can we then look at exactly this question, IDH with TP53, IDH with NPM1, IDH with FLT3, you know, what's happening to the allelic burden, because I think we, we're not going to have the bandwidth to do 40, 50 randomized studies. So it will be one or two big ones, but then collect all the data from them. I will use this, the point that Dr. Stein made about opening these randomized trials quickly because <laughs> of all the different agents and options to make a plug for a special scientific program that we actually have starting around 1.30 or 2 today, which the topic is accelerating clinical trials in hematology, and it has everybody including people that design trials as well as regulatory agencies talking about it. It's new this year at ASH. So if you guys have time, just please drop in. Great. So let's see, another question. A lot of these are about FLT3 that we already kind of discussed a lot about. Criteria for fitness, unfitness. Mm. <laughs> we, we went through one hour and 45 minutes <laughs> without bringing up fitness. Uh, but so, somebody's asking. So I'm going to start with Dr. DiNardo on this one. How do you... <laughs> look at fitness versus unfitness today in your patient. Age, other factors, doesn't matter, all molecular, what do you think? Gosh, I hate <laughs> this question. Um, <laughs> I, I, because you can't really answer it in one sentence. You know, there's not an easy answer for fitness. Age plays a role, um, comorbidities plays a role. Um, the kind of the kind of the, the logistics and feasibility and kind of the family structure plays a role too. You know, you, Uma, you made that point earlier about, you know, can my patient come back and forth to the clinic? How far away do they live? You know, like that's not really fitness per se, but that is also part of the treatment decision. Um, and I think, you know, I think there's patient fitness and there's also kind of what people are calling genomic fitness. And so, you know, if you have a kind of a, a patient who has a, you know, a performance status of one can get out there, is doing his thing and has mild, well-controlled, you know, blood pressure or heart or diabetes issues, but has, you know, a, a P53 mutation like we've been talking about, just because he could tolerate intensive chemotherapy, that is a patient that to me is not fit for intensive chemotherapy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think to, to summarize, and I think most of us may agree on this, I think it's really moving the biological fitness. You know, the argument about physical fitness is not that important because, as you said, a 30-year-old or a 75-year-old TP53 mutated do almost exactly the same poorly. And a 30-year-old or 75-year-old with core binding factor, isolated NPM1, do almost the same exactly well. So 
you know, of course there's outliers, and yes, if you have somebody who's 80, we're not going to give him intensive, and so on and so forth. But in general, I think we are selecting much more based on the biology, the underlying molecular mutation, than the physical age, performance status, fitness, um, you know, in those situations. I Somebody, guess the one thing I feel like we can all on the podium agree on is the slide that you opened with, Naval, where you showed sort of real-world data where a lot of older AML patients potentially because of fitness or otherwise are just not being offered any therapy. So I think what, what we really want to emphasize is now we have, as Dr. Stein mentioned, our cornucopia of different options. So the fitness may be because of the disease, and so not offering any therapy is probably not the way to go. Yeah, I, I think except in some patients where clearly they are sure. not able to tolerate anything. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, in addition to opening trials quickly, as you know, one thing is we really need to increase enrollment. I think this is one of the things where the U.S. is unfortunately one of the lowest in all the advanced mm -hmm. countries. You know, in, in Europe, Australia, they have higher enrollment rates much more than us. So I think that's a big effort, especially now, because we really need every patient to help us understand. And also we're giving patients usually standard of care plus. So you're getting a better treatment and we're learning and moving the field forward. So I think that will be very important. So yeah, we're just about at time. Uh, so I'm going to close out here. Uh, and I think that's really it. And, you know, I think one of the nice things I want to like thank Peerview very much for their help with these slides is they actually, we pulled in a lot of upcoming data at ASH. That's mm -hmm. not usually how we do it. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, so I think you can be directed to some of the nice upcoming talks and kind of a snippet of some of those. And uh, it's great to see that these are almost all different slides than what we would have used five, six years ago, <laughs> yeah. right? That's yeah. not uh, necessarily how it was a decade ago. So hopefully five years from now, it'll be a completely new set and yeah, new questions. That's right. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Stein, Dr. DiNardo, Dr. Barade very much. And uh, have a great ASH, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash HCQ860. This activity is supported by independent educational grants from Astellas Pharma Global Development Incorporated and Jazz Pharmaceuticals Incorporated.